he didn't write his own autobiography. Well, indeed. Um, well, he, he started the process, actually, but uh, didn't, didn't get to finish it. Uh, and, yeah, so we thought we have to, we have to pull a book together. Uh, we have to celebrate his legacy and have it all in, in one place, mm. which has taken us a couple of years because we wanted to get everyone involved with it and, and the cast list in there from Presidents Clinton, Bush Senior, all the living Prime Ministers, McCartney, Kane, Lloyd Webber, Prince Charles, Prince Andrew, we, we've got them all in there because mm. it's the family's book and, and, and they did that for us. Why did he not necessarily talk about his own life? Why was he so fascinated and intrigued by other people? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, and lots of people say that, that even if you were in a, you know, outside a TV studio environment, if you're just having dinner with him, he was always asking the questions. And, and I think that probably was a, a slight subconscious uh, aspect with him, that he didn't like opening up his emotional side mm. that much. Of course, he did with, with Mum and with us. Mm. Most of it was just that he was fascinated by people, so he loved asking questions and, and finding out more about people. Describe him as a dad, then. What was he like? Uh, sim simply the, the best. I mean, he was, uh, you know, of course, there's this great public side of, of his life and, and we obviously benefited from that and I'm very, very grateful for that. From a, a young age, we were aware that he was different um, without knowing exactly who people were that came for lunch or, 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 or dinner, whether it was a, you know, Thatcher or Major or someone like that. We wouldn't necessarily be fully aware. So they'd be quite the... regularly coming around for dinner, would they? Yeah, they came around quite a lot. Um, some more than others. I don't want to... Bl no, I mean, John Major came plenty of times. Thatcher came the first Sunday after she was ousted for Sunday lunch, just weeks after they tussled on TV, which shows the, the level of the relationship yeah. he was able to have. But we probably weren't fully aware who those people were, so we sort of annoyed them as if they were uncles or neighbours, <laughs> uh, anyone else. But I think from a young age... Uh, whether it was in Dad in the TV studio or Dad at home collecting us from school in front of teachers and parents, you know, one was always aware that he was centre of attention for everyone, yes. that he was slightly special on that level. Uh, and I suppose that just amplified the thought that we had as, as sons that, that Dad was centre of the universe. You know? uh, and what made him so great at what he did? What was it that was so special about him? He didn't just go with a, a clipboard set of questions one by one and... Uh, he allowed the answers to breathe as well. You know, mm. he said the importance of silence to, to let people go where they're going to go rather than just butting in. But if, if there was one thing for me that really stands out from, from going through this process with the book, it's he just loved what he did. Mm. And uh, that enjoyment, I think, was, was very infectious. I think it was, uh, it was Joanna Lumley um, who says in the book he had a strange way of appearing not to be on top of things which is incredibly clever, because mm. if, you, if you appear to be, although he was razor sharp, if you appear to be a little um, not entirely sure where it is that you're going, then your guest is really very vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I might get away with this here. He's not, and then he would come at you with surgical precision. Absolutely. I'm waiting for you guys to drop that question to me because <laughs> I'm feeling very relaxed. But no, John Major puts the same point in the book in a different way, uh, and he said it's like sitting in a warm bath never knowing when the cold shower above would come on. <laughs> an an on, odd great, image of it? the former Prime Minister. But also, but, uh, um, it's, a, it's the kind of point. <laughs> surgical preparation as well, and, and knowing the subject, knowing where he was going to go with mm -hmm. it, or being so well-read that if something drifted off onto another course, then he would certainly have that knowledge at, uh, at, at to hand. So during that interview with Muhammad Ali, Ali had said uh, in the Bible, it, uh, it says, all white people are devils. Mm. And, and he categorically said that in Romans 3, 9, it, the, there is no such thing. Yeah. It, that's a particularly great example of Dad's level of preparation. And as you say, to be able to go off on a tangent wherever the guest takes him, because Dad's father was a, a Methodist priest, mm. and Dad was very religious himself. He said his, his prayers um, every night. So not only was he well prepped for what he thought would come up in that interview, but when uh, Muhammad Ali went off on that, he really met his match because yeah. Dad basically knew the Bible off by well, heart he and said, threw that straight back He said, it. no, that's not right. And, and Muhammad Ali then went and got a, got a Bible mm. and came back and opened it up and went, oh, no, yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 It was a great what, moment. There. What do you think he would have said was the greatest moment of his career? Would it have been the Nixon interviews? Uh, it's a, a very, very interesting question. I think Dad would have slightly tweaked his answer depending exactly how it was worded. And, and Mandela, why aren't you angry? Why aren't you bitter? Uh, and Mandela said, well, I would love to be bitter, but there is no time to be bitter, for there is work yeah. to be done. And I think, you know, that quotation he was particularly proud of. Yeah. I suppose that the career as a whole, though, you know, he did something he adored. 
something that was very competitive and he managed to do it for 50 years yeah. and you know that is is pretty astonishing in this industry as, as you two know we were, we were all so so shocked um by by his sudden death but but also as a family this is tinged with even greater sadness is the fact that that july this year you you lost your brother um uh, miles we all were just getting into a position where you know two years on from dad that we were ready to really celebrate dad's life rather than than feel just the pain of it um uh, absolutely when, when miles went it it's just a, a devastating extra shock and uh over the last couple of years particularly the last two months i've really come to believe in in the idea that that grief is the price we pay for love and uh we're paying a, a ridiculously high price at the moment and at times the pain is you know unfathomable but that's only because miles enriched our lives so very much and and that's what we have to try and focus on it albeit well what a, what doesn't, a, a wonderful thing that for, for you as a family to have been able to come together to celebrate the life of this extraordinary man <laughs>